When I was eight years old, I was chosen to represent my country for just one day, just one moment in time. The political context of the situation was well above my head at the time. For my best friend Mercy and I, it meant only one thing, and it was the most exciting thing we could think of, a chance to meet our hero, the great leader himself, our Prime Minister, Comrade Robert Mugabe. For two young girls born not long before the start of Zimbabwean independence, this was as big as it got. Mugabe dominated our TV screens and newspaper headlines. His photo was on the wall of every shop, every office, every school hall. At that age, it was like being chosen to meet a movie star. It was enormously exciting. I remember being driven to the tarmac of our city's military airbase and left there for what felt like hours in the hot sun practicing curtsies. Eventually, an Air Force plane touched down and Mugabe stepped out with President Samora Michel of Mozambique. People seemed to materialize out of nowhere. There were women singing and dancing, men waving flags and banners, a brass band playing. A wreath of flowers was pressed into my hands and I was pushed forward towards the leaders. I remember shaking as I put the flowers over their heads and they smiled down on us. Years later, as a young adult, I began to reflect on the significance of this experience, only now with more awareness of history and politics. Samora Michelle only lived another 10 days before being killed when his plane crashed over South Africa. Robert Mugabe, as we know, despite the recent elections, remains leader of Zimbabwe three decades on. Mercy and I stayed best friends until we were teenagers, even after my family left Zimbabwe and moved to New Zealand. At 19, we saw each other one last time before losing contact. At that age, we were preoccupied with our own lives, and Mercy was heading off to Teachers College in Zimbabwe, and I was studying at the University of Otago, slash exploring the full extent of the social life it had to offer. A couple of changes of address later, and Mercy had gone off the radar. Around about this time, in the new millennium, Zimbabwe was beginning to make international headlines. White farmers were being violently forced off their land by the government, and there's nothing quite like white people being targeted for activating the media. But what we also knew was that general political violence was being stepped up across the country, and I began to worry about mercy. The advent of social networking, Facebook in particular, was an absolute godsend for immigrants like me. In fact, it was quite an emotional experience. And suddenly, I could be in instant and regular contact with the friends I'd grown up with but hadn't seen in years. And one by one, I caught up with my classmates, catching up on their lives and what they were going through. Through the mid-2000s, I watched as they, and in fact most of my generation, left Zimbabwe amidst increasing bloodshed and the economic collapse. Of my primary school year, only two or three remain in Zimbabwe today. But there was still no sign of mercy. No one had seen her, no one had heard from her. Unlike almost all of the others, she seemed to have no presence on the internet. And my worry for her was increasing. By now, it was 2008, and facing defeat in the 2008 elections, Mugabe stepped up his campaign of violence, leaving many dead and plenty more brutally injured around that time. What's less well known is that people in the opposition areas were also dying in their thousands from the deliberate withholding of food aid and AIDS treatment. Almost any immigrant will tell you that the importance of a friendship increases dramatically when you leave a country. Your friends back home become not only your friends, but a representation of everything you've left behind, all that you are, a part of you that no one in your new country can possibly understand. I began to feel a stronger and stronger need to find mercy. Eventually, I embarked on a ground search across Zimbabwe. 
And I decided to film my journey, and the result is a documentary called Finding Mercy, which is why I'm standing here today. With adult eyes, it's easy to tell why Mercy and I were once seen as representative of the New Zimbabwe. We could have been any one of hundreds of thousands of similar friendships across the country. But growing up as children, we were innocent of any division between black and white. As we know here in New Zealand, it's common for people overseas to confuse New Zealand with Australia. In the same way, it's very common for people to confuse Zimbabwe with South Africa. But during our childhood, the two countries' circumstances could not have been more different. In Zimbabwe, we were enjoying the post-colonial honeymoon period, going to school within a strong, racially integrated education system that we were fiercely proud of. South Africa, meanwhile, was still locked in the thick of apartheid. But what our own smiling faces hid the day Mugabe came to town was, in fact, one of the darkest and bloodiest periods in Zimbabwe's history. Literally only a few miles from where we stood that day was the beginning of the Matabeleland region, where men, women, children, and babies were being brutally massacred by Mugabe's North Korean trained special forces known as the 5th Brigade. Although they were united in their bid to overthrow the colonial Rhodesian government, Mugabe's Shona tribe and the Ndebele from Matabele land were ancient rivals. In those first early years of his rule, Mugabe saw the Ndebele as the greatest threat to his leadership. So he set out on a mission essentially of ethnic cleansing, which he called Gokorahundi, the rain that washes away the chaff. Mercy was in Debele. But both she and I lived outside the region in the Midlands. It defies belief that my family, and to the best of my knowledge, Mercy's family, knew nothing of such large scale civilian genocide at the time but seemingly no one outside the territory did. Vast areas of Matabele land were sealed off by military. I remember our family car being stopped in the area once at a roadblock. Now, normally the roadblocks were manned by police, but this one was military. While one soldier questioned my parents about where they were heading, another held his rifle to my head, and a third aimed his at my brother, who was four years old at the time until my mother screamed at them to stop. And no one could come in, no one could go out. State-controlled media ensured that nothing from the region was being reported, and those who survived were too terrified to breathe a word. When reports began to emerge in the foreign media, the Mugabe regime simply upped the propaganda back home. As a child, I remember being terrified by the notion of murderous Indabeli bandits roving the countryside that were talked about on TV every night and in the newspapers. Such a large and monstrous enemy was created in our minds that we were relieved to see truckloads of armed soldiers rolling into Matabele land to deal with these terrorists. The awful reality of what was actually happening we would only find out years later. How do you feel when you find out about some real human horror that has unfolded so close to you? It's a strange and deeply disturbing experience. You can do it! <laughs> Thank you. It would leave images in my mind for the rest of my life. When I was five, I fell over one day, splitting my forehead open on a rock. It needed stitches, so mum took me to the hospital. Ahead of us in the queue, two armed soldiers were dragging a guy in handcuffs. He had a gaping bullet wound in his side, which was right at my eye level at the time. One of the soldiers saw me staring and asked what I was looking at. 
and he told me he caught a bandit and then he kicked the guy hard to make him stand upright. A few months later, we were all watching Riveted on the news as um, footage unfolded of another so-called bandit being chased through the bush by helicopter and eventually gunned down. His torn up body was paraded through our town as an example of the military's continued success. Images like these leave an impact on someone's life. They continue to have an impact on mine. Zimbabwe will always be a part of me, just as it will always be part of the millions of other Zimbabweans who have also left the country. Some of them are white, the vast majority are not. This is not a black and white issue in any stretch of the imagination. Although my family went through a lot, leaving the country, starting all over again, we were ultimately able to do that and to do it all together. For many of the Zimbabweans I know, that's not the case. As a child, I did not have the experience of watching my parents leave to live elsewhere so that they could send money back for us to eat. I did not see my family killed right in front of me. I was not held captive and forced to torture someone or be tortured myself. I know many of the Zimbabweans for whom this is their reality. To some extent, Mercy and I are still representative of Zimbabwe, only this time the less glossy version. Like so many others, I'm part of the diaspora with all the opportunities but also dislocation that that brings. The last time I had seen Mercy's family, they didn't have the option of leaving. When I arrived in Zimbabwe to begin my search for her, life expectancy for a woman, the average life expectancy was 32. That was my age and Mercy's age. I realized that I might not find her at all. I knew that the journey would be risky. With so much to hide, and despite the unity government, the Mugabe regime is still hostile to and controlling of foreign media. So we decided to film undercover. And a few times, partly due to naivety on my part, we got ourselves into tense situations. But the risk that we took is nothing compared to the risks that people are taking on a daily basis still within Zimbabwe to work for change. Like these women from one of the opposition areas that I met. And I also felt that it was a risk worth taking. Not only was I desperate to find my friend and carrying the immigrant guilt of having left her behind, but I also hoped that through the film I'd be able to offer a better understanding to those in the outside world of the realities of the Zimbabwe situation to help people engage with it a little bit more. Because out here in the Western world, we hear a lot about white farmers. Now, that actually suits Mugabe. In fact, over the years, he's actively encouraged it because it allows him to make it appear that, albeit he's going about it in all the wrong ways, it makes it appear that all he's doing is redressing colonial wrongs. And let me be very clear, there are plenty of colonial wrongs to be redressed. But what we don't hear about is the black farmers whose land has also been taken, like another of my school friends who I caught up with on my journey. Or the farm workers whose lives and often livelihoods are lost in the process. Or the groups of local children who are held captive in what used to be farmhouses and re-educated. As I was saying before, it's a strange and deeply disturbing experience finding out about these things that have unfolded so close to you that you have not at the time known about. And although we didn't know about it and couldn't have likely done anything even if we tried, I couldn't help feeling in some way complicit. And I guess in some ways this is what motivated my journey to find mercy. Did I find mercy? Yes, but certainly not in the way I had expected to. What I can say is that my journey was infinitely more difficult and complex than I could even have imagined. 
And along the way, I myself gained whole new insights into the Zimbabwe situation that I hope I've been able to share through the film. Because Zimbabwe remains a beautiful and fertile country with rich natural resources and strong culture. Most importantly, hope remains. And rebuilding will take time, it'll take patience, and it will take safe leadership. But I like to believe it is possible. Despite his best efforts to convince the population otherwise, which continue to this day, the problems in Zimbabwe are not black versus white, nor are they Shona versus Ndebele. It is quite simply a brutal regime working for its own gains at the expense of the people. While I was making the film, I thought a lot about the innocence of my early friendship with Mercy and how oblivious we were to the politics that surrounded us. One of my favorite moments on my journey was meeting with a group of other Zimbabwean friends, now all living in South Africa, the same age as me. One of them remembered making a friend on her first day of school. She went running home saying, Mummy, Mummy, I made a new friend today. I always said to her mum, what's your friend's name? Vanilla, she said. <laughs> okay, said her mum, and what color is vanilla? I don't know, she said. I'll ask her tomorrow. <laughs> Nelson Mandela once said, no one is born hating another person because of the color of his skin or his religion or his background. We must learn to hate. How true that is. In Zimbabwe, we learn to hate by being taught to fear, and fear is a very effective weapon. It's used to justify war, violence, interrogation, the removal of people's rights and protections. Mugabe is very clever at manipulating it, but he is certainly not alone. The use of fear as justification is something we have all become particularly familiar with in the last decade or so of global history. How do we feel when we find out about real human horrors that have been carried out in the name of making us feel safe? Do we feel complicit? In almost any population, no matter what the politics, there will be young friendships like mine and Mercy's, across race lines or religious lines or differences in sexuality, unaware yet that in time they may be taught to hate or fear what the other represents. It's an interesting thing to try next time you meet someone or you pass someone in the street, no matter how open-minded you think you are or what your background or your own ethnicity is, do you find yourself automatically noting their color, their religious dress, perhaps how well they fit your expectations of gender? Or can you just see another fellow human being and you have to ask them the rest tomorrow? As my journey has left me wondering if we as adults could all still see each other the way small children do, how different would the world be? <laughs>